Okay, so this session, like I said earlier, on, we'll be going into capacity planning. We'll look at velocity and burn down charts, which are part of the Scrum charts. And we're going to start with capacity. So with our capacity, we'll be looking at um, the meaning of capacity planning, understanding what capacity planning is, how we collect the data to plan our capacity, the benefits, of um, planning your capacity, how you do your calculation, and then also the location on your Azure DevOps. Okay, so what is capacity planning? Capacity planning is the estimate and calculation of a Scrum team's available productive hours for the next sprint. So you are in one sprint, you need to plan for the next sprint. Your capacity planning is you planning the capacity of your team, of their productive hours that they're going to give or they're going to use in the next sprint that you're going into. And what this does is, is, is that it helps you to determine the capacity that is required and helps you also when you're committing to work that needed to be done during that sprint. Okay, You're able to analyze the existing capacity. So um, the capacity that um, Vivian has for this sprint doesn't mean that's the capacity she will have all the time. So when you plan your capacity, it helps you to focus on the number of work you can commit to, and it helps you also to make an informed decision regarding the, the, the sprints that you're going into, okay? So there are some things we need to understand when we're planning a capacity. And one of it is that the team's capacity is based on the team's productive hours. So I'm, I'm working eight hours. Doesn't mean all the eight hours are my productive hours. So any any hours you use for meetings, any hours you use for, you've gone for training, any hours you've gone for your break time is not seen as productive hours. Productive hours means the hours you're actually using, doing, um, if it's a developer, developing, if it's a tester, testing, and if it's a BA, the, the hours you use actually writing stories are, are the hours that are termed as your productive hours. The times you have also for all your plannings, you know, you attend your meetings are also seen as part of your productive hours. But we will see how that plays out in the um in the as we go along. So your capacity capacity is planned based on your team members' availability. That's another thing you need to understand. So you don't plan it based on um Martha is going on an holiday. You can't plan capacity. You know, Rumi did a bit of explanation of that uh, when we when we met. I think it was Monday or Tuesday now when she was showing you on Azure DevOps to say that if you're going on a holiday, there's a place where you actually take it up. So that person is not available at that particular time. So you have to have an understanding that when you're pl planning your capacity, uh, you have to think about the team member's availability. And then your capacity planning has to be done two to three days before your sprint planning date. So you don't do do it on your sprint planning date. You have to do it prior to your sprint planning date. Okay. And then we'll see some of the things that needs to be done. And that will tell you why you need to do it prior to your sprint planning date. Consideration has to be given to team members status. Okay. So it could be a full team member or it could be a borrowed or a shared resource. I will explain what I mean by that. So a full team member is a, a, part, a, a part of that scrum team. A borrowed member is a situation where you have one of your team members, they have an emergency, they can't participate during that sprint. And that sprint is very important. Maybe it's a sprint uh, that is prior to a release. And you just need somebody to come in from another team who understands the project, who is able to carry out that, that responsibility of that team members. Let's assume a developer is not feeling well or you know they have an emergency they need to take care of. You're able to have a borrowed resource. You borrow um, the a part, a percentage of another developer from another team. So you're not pulling that developer from that team. You're just borrowing a percentage of their time. It could be 50-50. It could be 60-40. You know, they give 60% to their own team and then they give 40 onto your own team. All those are the things you think about when you're planning the capacity. The team's capacity also is based on estimate of a future activity. So you don't plan capacity for a sprint that you're doing right now. You should have planned that prior, you know. So any capacity plan that you do is for a future um, activity. Uh, activity, a new sprint, the next sprint, you know, and then we look at our velocity. Your velocity measures the past activity. You'll see how we're able to relate it together as we go along. Okay, so we can use 
a statement like let's use this you know meaning the capacity let's use this that we have or that we might have because remember it's an estimate it's not definite it's an estimate it's not absolute okay so let's use this that we might have in order to achieve this work that we want to do which is your sprint goal based on our past performance that's your velocity that is how you relate your capacity your sprint goal and your velocity together so you're planning for a future work that you want to do which is what you need to do in the next sprint you need the capacity what capacity do we have that what are we going to have that we might have in order to do this work the work is the sprint goal that you need to do based on how we've done, you know, in the past. That's when your velocity, you use your velocity to be able to forecast what you need to do during the sprint. Quickly, we look at um, our data collection. How do we collect data? Okay. How do we collect the information? How the, the, the data we're collecting is the information that helps us to plan. Okay. You can do that during a meeting. Okay, you gather the team members together for a brief meeting, roughly maybe less than 30 minutes even, to collect necessary information. Who is having a day off? Who is going on a holiday? Who is having a training? You know, things like that. You get those information. You can, like I said, you can cut them into a meeting. Oh, I'm I'm planning the capacity for the team. Um, let me know anybody who is going on a holiday. I need to know who is, you know, taking a day off. Who is taking a full day off who is taking a half day off and everything you want to get all those information because those are the information you need to be able to plan that capacity okay you can do that in a meeting you can do um you can get them to update a document so if you don't want to be calling people every sprint you know um 30 minutes every sprint to do that you can actually create an excel document on g drive and share it with the whole team members. They know what they need to do. You already orient them what they need to do. So they go there to populate um, that document with the information you need. So I'm going on holiday. I will just go there where the calendar or, or the, for the particular day that I'm going on, I click on it. And then it's just, you know, it might go red, depending on how you've created it, to show. And then I might put my initials on it. And then it shows. Some use simple Excel document, put it on J Drive and all that. They've, they've stated out all the days of that sprint. And then by the time you go into it, um, you can put your name in a particular date. You do half to show maybe it's half date that you're taking off or you do full, put your initial and slash it and put one to show full day and all that. You would have, you know, like I said, you would have informed your team members so they know how to populate that document. And then you can train them, like I said, train the team on capacity planning to help to help them themselves to self-manage. So you have the plan, you've already done the capacity plan, you've you've been able to format your Excel document in such a way that by the time they put their um capacity in and everything automatically it calculates itself and maybe the, if there's any other part that you needed to do you do that so once they're able to do that you just pick on that document which is shared and everybody has access to it and use that to populate your azure board based on the um information that has been put on that document so that's how you collect um um, data that you need, you know, which will help you to plan. Okay, we want to look at the benefits of capacity planning. Okay, one of the benefits is that it's for bet, it helps for better sprint planning. So by the time you you are able to um, um, plan your sprint properly, plan the capacity properly, it helps your it helps your sprint planning because you have all the information you need that will help you to commit to the work that you needed to do. It helps the team to, you know, accurately commit to work. We know the capacity of everybody. We know what our capacity is for the sprint. So we are not over committing and then we are not uh, under committing. So over committing is when you you commit to more than what your capacity is saying. And under committing is when you take in stories that are less than the team's capacity. So in, in, when, in a situation where you under commit, you finish all the work you need to do before the end of the sprint. And when you over commit, definitely you know what is going to happen. You won't finish what you need to do and then you have a spillover into another sprint. Okay, so it helps you to, you know, um, it helps you better when you're doing your sprint planning. It also improves your commitment reliability. Okay, over time, you know, team members are able to commit, uh, to get their commitment improved and is reliable by looking at the capacity plan, 
pattern. You as a scrum master or the team are able to look at to say that, okay, so there is a pattern of this person taking time off maybe every Thursday and Friday, which is not because they are, they are, they are, they are slacking off. It might be because of personal reasons. It might be because of childcare and all that. When you are committing to stories, you know, you're able to rely to say that, okay, every sprint, every Thursday and Friday, uh, a day takes time off you know, because of childcare and all that and everything. And as a result, we have limited time. Ade has limited cap capacity. And we know that that's a pattern. You know, it's not a one-off, it's a pattern going forward. And as a result, because of that pattern that you have, you're able to uh, rely on your commitment better. You improve your commitment as you go ahead. You know the number of stories that you give to Ade. You know the number of stories that is going to be allocated to Ade and all that. And that helps you to know what what your capacity is and what you're able to take in into the sprint. Capacity planning also helps to um, control your scope creep. Scope creep is when you have additional work being added to the sprint. You know, like I've said earlier on, the PO brings additional stories to the sprint, okay? That was not initially planned. When you have your capacity planned, you are able to use your capacity that you've planned, which you know. Okay, so the team's capacity going forward is uh, maybe... Um, Let's assume 100 hours for every team member. Total capacity is 100, 100 um, um, hours. And then with that 100 hours, you've already committed to work that that capacity is able to use. Okay, So you're able to control scope creep because then you're able to negotiate with the product owner because you are aware of the team's capacity to say, okay, these new stories that you want us to take in, we don't have the capacity to do it. If you don't plan the capacity, you won't be able to say that. So when you plan the capacity, to your, your capacity, you're able to say, oh, we don't have the capacity to do this. But if it's priority and we need to take it in, can we take out another story so that we can accommodate this one that you want us to take in? And you're doing that again because you, so you're controlling scope creep so that you don't just have increase, increase of work. You'll have the work that the team can commit to in that sprint. And another benefit of it is that it, it helps with better allocation of tasks. Yeah, you know, like I use the example of if we know that and um, Ade normally takes Thursday and um Friday off work, we know he has limited capacity. You won't give Ade the same or uh, the same task won't be allocated to Ade as it's been allocated to Martha, who is giving you full capacity. So it helps you to be able to do that. So that at the end of the day, you don't have a situation where team members are not able to complete their work because you've allocated too much work to somebody that doesn't have the capacity to do that work. And then, um, okay, so we now, the next step is for us to look at some factors and how they affect your capacity. So we want to look at steps of calculating our capacity. Okay, um, please bear with me before we do that. Okay, all right, go ahead. Okay, so this is just to show us um, the step. So we want to look at our calendar, the sprint duration. I know you're doing... Um, weekly sprint, but this slide has been prepared for uh, a, a two weekly sprint, which is what you will have out there. You did remember that he said that for the purpose of your internship, that's why it has been done weekly sprints, but out there you will have a two weekly sprint. Okay. And in a two weekly sprint, we're talking about 10 days. So I've just used these dates that we have just to give us, you know, uh, clarity and understanding. So we have 10 days. You, you can see the date of the 10 days, Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, the second week. And then we have 10 days. So that's the first step you want to get in your calendar. Okay. For your sprint capacity, um, for your capacity planning, you want to know the duration of your sprint. And after that, the step, your second step is to know your team members and their roles. So in the first column, you can see all the team members there. In the second column, you can see the um, the roles there. Remember what we said, that the people that are actually carrying out work during the sprints are the developers and the testers, mainly them. And those are the people you need their capacity. The capacity you need to plan is for those people. Don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean the scrum master doesn't work during the sprints. And that doesn't mean the PO doesn't work during the sprints. Please bear with me. And that doesn't mean sorry about that. And that doesn't mean your PO or your BA or the scrum masters are not working during the sprint. When I say developer, at times I mean the software developer. Remember, a DA, a, a, a data analyst, can also be working in your squad. They are seen as developer because they will be developing um, any data. 
um, tool they're using, the, the SQL or Tableau, anything they're using, they will be developing that. So they're seen as developers also if you are working on your team. Okay, so you want to get, those are the people you need to get their data. Uh, sorry, their capacity. Now, that doesn't mean that if a VA has to go on holiday, a Scrum Master has an holiday, or a, um, uh, a PO has an holiday, there is no uh, a doc there's no document they, they put their own capacity on. There, so there's a, 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 there's a time sheet, you know, for work and all that, which every organization, you know, you, you're clocking, you, you have your once you're clocking, the organization has set, maybe you're working remotely, the, the laptop you're using has been set in such a way that when you're clocking, the, it's been um, picked up. So that's you um, um, setting your capacity for the sprint. When you have an knowledge, definitely you will tell your line manager and that is recorded down and everything. But the capacity we're planning right now is for work that is being done during the sprint. Remember we talked about productive hours that is being used to carry out work during the sprint. And the people that actually carry out um, development work during the sprint are the developers and the testers. The DAs also, I'm, I, I would I would call the DAs the developers. So just see that they're part of the developers also, okay? So so these are the teams we have. And that's why you're saying under the road, just developers and testers alone. And then on the third column, you're looking at the allocation that I talked about. So John, James, Mary, Michael, Chris, Gerard, they all have 100% allocation. So they are full team members. However, Agatha has 50% allocation because maybe Agatha is a borrowed source from another team and the, the percentage that she's giving, she's allocating to that project is just 50% allocation. And that total somehow in your, when you're doing your um, capacity planning. So you can see that hours of days, uh, the standard hours of days that they've been employed for has been put there. So for the first um, uh, six members, you can see it is eight hours a day, but for Agatha, Agatha, because she's doing 50% on your project, you can't put 80 for her. You only, sorry, you can't put eight for her. So our 50% allocation, she's just going to do four hours on your project per day during that sprint, sprint because she's using the, the remaining 50% on another project. And then we do the calculation in hours. You know, we already said it's our calendar is 10 days. So if it's eight hours per day, then it's 10 hours per sprint. And then you can see the calculation at the bottom. So you look at that at time, you said, oh, the, 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 the whole team has 520 hours to work on that day, but it, it really doesn't, um, there are some factors that would uh, you need to put in place. And we will see that as we go along. And these are the factors that affect your capacity planning. So you have default distribution. Your default distribution is the standard hours you're expected to work as an employee of the organization. You know, like I was, we saw earlier on, the eight hours that is being put in place. So those are the, that's your default distribution because that's the standard hours that the organization has employed you. You resume nine o'clock, you finish AB, 5 p.m. That makes a total of um, um, eight hours. Is That's the default, okay? So the, the, the factor, another factor that comes into your capacity planning is your scrum event. Okay, so you have Scrum event time and you need to factor that into your capacity planning. These are the hours you spend for all your Scrum events, your sprint planning, your daily Scrum, your sprint review, your sprint retrospective, and then your sprint refinement. All those time also, they come in into play when it comes to do with the productive hours you use to actually carry out work. Another one is individual full day off. You know, when a team member has a full day off, that, that one is a self-explanatory. That is put into place also. You have um, team individual either full day off, you have individual um, half day off that is put into it. You have team holiday. Those are bank holidays that affect not just you, uh, an individual team member, but you know the whole team, the whole organization at large where it is given. Okay, and then you have um, things like other meetings. This includes, apart from your team, uh, your Scrum event. These are teams that maybe they are for trainings, the, the, your line manager, the line manager for the key ways of uh, um, arrange a training for them because maybe the organization is upgrading its system and they, then they need to train the developers and the testers in the new system that they are now using. So there will be uh, meetings, training meetings that have been organized for them. You have to factor that also into your, it's, it's not something that happens all the time, but when it happens, you need to factor it also into your capacity planning. 
And then, like I said, you have individual partial day off and all that. You have your, your focus factor. So the focus factor is the same team's capability to remain focused. That is the time actually now that you have used to actually work. So all these um, scrum events, um, other meetings, they are productive hours but they are not the focus factor. The focus factor now is the one that you actually use. That's time that you sit down and you're working. That is the focus factor. And that is what would determine really your capacity that the team has at the end of the day, which we're, we're going to be able to see as we go along. Okay, so um, the table we had earlier on, I'm just going to quickly take you there. I've just elongated it out here. Okay, so this table we have here where we have eight day, eight hours per day, 10 hours per sprint is what I've been now able to um, break down on this table here. So by default that I was talking about to say you are, you are um, employed for eight hours per day and you're doing two weeks of sprint, this is your 520 hours based on your allocation, based on the hours per day, this is what you have. You do eight hours every day and all that. You will see when we go to the next slide why we needed to do it out this way, okay? Okay, so this is another slide. Okay, so the factor we're bringing in here is a team holiday. So let's assume 16th of January was a bank holiday. If you look at that column that has 16th of January, you can see zero recorded all through for everyone not just for one person, for everyone. And that all affects the total of 520 that we had earlier on. Can you see? It's, we have to remove uh, 52 hours out of that 520 hours that we have. And you can see the total now being 468. So your capacity, your team's capacity is not 520 when you start bringing in those factors. So we've brought in the factor that, okay, there's a bank holiday. So eight hours has been reduced from everybody's um, total hours per sprint. So from 80, it has become 72 hours for everyone. And Agatha zone also has reduced to 36 from 40. And you've, the total we now have is 468. If we go to the next uh, one, you now we can see it, with that um, bank holiday we have, some team members are taking day off, okay? So James has taken the 13th off and also the 17th off. So there was a bank holiday on maybe that's a Monday. The, yeah, no, no, baby, that's a Monday. So he's taking the Friday prior to that bank holiday off and he's also taking the Monday off. Maybe the family is going on holiday and they just needed more time. So he's taking two days more off apart from the one day bank holiday. And that has reduced his total hours for the sprint to 56. Mary also, Mary has not taken, no, no Mary, also took some days or because for her to have six to four, I'm thinking, yes. So Mary also took the 17th off. We can see a zero for Mary on the 17th. So she took just one day off and that has affected, dropped, no, not affected, dropped her total hours for the sprint from 72 to 64. Michael also took um, half day off on the 10th of January. That's why you have a four there for Michael. And that has made Michael's total 68 hours. Chris took a half day off on the 19th of January. And that Chris also has a 68. Gerard is still keeping to the old 72. So it's just being affected by just the bank holiday alone. And then Agat also has taken another half, and has taken her own day off on the 18th. You know, she is allocated 50%. Uh, and so she's taken um, a day off on the 18th from your team. And from at 36 hours you ha she had before is 32. Now look at the total we're having. From, from 520, when we removed the bank holiday, it went to 460. And then from 460, with everybody taking some day off or half day off or full day off, we now have a 432. Okay, so, um, so from there, we go to the next slide Bear with me. Okay, so we want now want to calculate this. The next step for you to do is to calculate your Scrum event time because you need to put that also into focus when you're calculating your, um, your sprint, your capacity planning. So refinement, you're doing refinement twice. This team is doing the refinement twice in a sprint. They do it every week. So they, they, they do it on maybe a Thursday. And they did it on the 12th. They did 
they took one hour, that's 60 minutes, another on the 19th, that's another 60 minutes. So the total minutes that has been taken up for that sprint is 120 minutes, which totals your two hours. And therefore their sprint planning also, they have their sprint planning the first day of the sprint uh, for two hours, that's a 120, okay, taken out again. And then you have your daily scrum 15 minutes every single day of the sprint. You total that up, that gives you 135. And then your review is at the end of sprint, another two hours at the end of sprint. You you, you put that in. And then your, your retro meeting also at the end of sprint on the Friday, on that Friday again for one hour, you factor that in. And then you add all those hours. In minutes, it's 555 minutes. And then in hours, you're looking at nine hour, 9.25 hours. And so you factor that into um, your planning. Okay, so we also look at calculating other meeting times. So Scrum coaching session, you've organized a Scrum coaching session for the team for the sprint, and you put that at two hours. You did that on a Friday, the first Friday of that sprint. You did that, so you're going to calculate that. The team members had to go for trainings. You know, maybe the like I said, the developer, all the testers, there were trainings that were organized for them. This doesn't come all the time is a one of your scrum coaching session doesn't come all the time is this is a is a, um um so they are not fixed variables they are varying uh they, they vary okay so the training also a uh, two hours let's say for this sprint we're going into there's a two hours training that has been organized for the team members you factor that in and at the end of the day you have a two hours there also that you need to put into your um your table okay so we're looking now at the total hours per sprint for each team member. And then we'll factor in the Scrum event, the total hours for the Scrum event, which is 9.25 hours, uh, sorry, 9.225 hours, yes, like we, we calculated. And then we're looking at the other meetings, which is four hours each. And when you add your, um, your Scrum event and your other meetings together, you have to deduct it from the total sprint hours for each person. And then you have your, that gives you available capacity. So for you to calculate your available capacity, you have to deduct your Scrum events and other meetings from, from the um, sprint hours of each team member. And then you're able to get your available capacity. And that's the calculation you have at the bottom. That's how you calculate your fixed factor. So what we have now is the fixed factor. Your available capacity is the fixed factor. Okay, and that you, you can see the formula at the bottom there. So you can see if I go back a bit, just because I just want us to um, see what we have prior to that. We had a four, 432 hours prior to that. By the time we remove the Scrum events, by the time we remove the other team meetings, you can see what we have. It's gone down to 339.25 hours that is, is available for the team. Okay, let's go for that. Let's look at other factors that affect things. Okay, so once we have that in place, once we are able to do that, we've put the available um, capacity in, we now want to do our focus factor. Okay, so because our focus factor will help us to be able to understand what our, our real capacity for, for the sprint is. Yeah, okay, so once we're able to do that, to work out your focus factor, your focus factor is the team's standard available capacity divided by the team's, I know we're going deep into math, <laughs> divided by the team's standard um, hours times 100. Okay, so I'm just going to pick um, one person to be able to do that. Let's pick John. You know, John, the only thing that has been, that has reduced from, I think John and um, Gerard is just the bank holiday. They didn't take any day off, okay? So I'm not using theirs to judge. I'm just using theirs because they are the ones that didn't take any half day, full day or anything off. It's just the bank holiday affecting their own um, 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 capacity. So the 558.75 we have there for available capacity, if we, if we approximate it, you have a 59 hours there. So your 59 hours there, what we're saying is you divide it by the 80, which is the standard hours that you've been employed to work. And then you now multiply that by 100 because your focus factor has to be in percentage. That's why we're multiplying it. By 100. And when you do that, you, you get a 
0.75%, uh, which when you approximate gives you a 74. And that 74 is not calculated individually. It's for the whole, that it has to be fixed for the whole. Okay, so don't think, oh, you've used John's zone to determine other people's zone. Like I explained, um, John and Gerard, they didn't take any day off, but the, 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 the focus factor is affected by the bank holiday. Okay, so a general holiday like that is what you use to work out your focus factor. So in a situation where there are no holiday, what you will have there is 80 divided by 80 times 100. That is what you'll have. And your focus factor will not end up being 100, isn't it? But because there's been a bank holiday, which we factored into things, um, and we've removed the scrum event and also the other meetings, okay, we're able to deduct that. So had it been everybody has an 80, what we would have done is to deduct the scrum events and other events from the 80, get our available capacity and then use our available capacity to work our focus factor. Okay, so that's why we have that all those 74% there. Now we now need to work out the real capacity, you know, per sprint or per day for the team. Okay, and for, to, for us to do that, the, the, the formula for working out your real capacity is what we have at the bottom there, is your available capacity times your focus factor. So the available capacity for each one is what you use. So you, for like for John, you use the 58.75 and times it by 74%. And that's why you have, um, for him, for the sprint, the hours, total hours that John has, the real capacity that he has to work for the sprint is the 43.7, uh, sorry, 43.47. And you work that out for each and every one. And you can see that from the available capacity of 339.25 that we have earlier on, it's dropped down to what? 251.01. And we're coming from what? We're coming from 520. But by the time we put all these factors in, it helps you to be able to now plan your capacity properly. And so um, for each uh, member of the team, so the total um, hours for the team to work, the real capacity for this team to work for this for the sprint, the next sprint they are going into, actually they just have 251.01 hours for the whole sprint. And then per day, for the total um, team per day, they have 27.83. And each one of them, you can see how, how many hours they are able to do real capacity per day from, from 521 to um, 251.01. So this helps you now to, you know, to plan, to plan your work going further. This helps you to plan um, the what you commit to going further. So we're not saying that, oh, but everybody is working eight hours per day, it's 10 hours per sprint, we're seven, uh, seven team members, that should be 50, 520. Oh, they have a large capacity to take on most work to be done in the sprint, but really they don't have it because there will be meetings, there will be this and that. So the real time they spend to actually do the, the exact work is actually the 251 hours. 251.01, but let's just approximate it to 251 hours. Those are the times they actually have. Those are the hours. And based on that is when you commit to what you need to do based on your capacity so that you don't overcommit and also you don't undercommit to so work that needs to be done. Okay. Um, yeah. So I've also been able to do it a situation where there were no bank holidays. So this is a situation you have if there are no bank holidays. So if all the hours for everybody is 50, sorry, is 80, and Agatha is still bringing in the 50%, which is 40, nobody took any time off and all that. No bank holiday. Everybody was, you know, everybody is full on for the whole sprint. So you will still deduct your scrum events and other meetings out of your 80 to get a 66.75. And you can see that the focus factor increased to 84 for everyone. Okay, and then you're not able to use that to do your real capacity and you get a 358.89. So if anybody had not taken any time off out of the 520 you have, you end up having a real capacity of 358 because nobody took any time off. Everybody is, is on board and you can see the hours that everybody has for the sprint, 56 hours or 56 hours to spend for the sprint and then 5.6 hours 
or let's say six hours per day to spend on what needs to be done. So that's a situation I just did that so that you have a situation of when there were no bank holidays and nobody took any time off. You have more capacity to work, definitely, than when there are holidays that has been taken out uh, by team members. Okay, so just to have a recap of um, the, the steps you need to take when you're doing your capacity planning. Okay, so you have to look at the you look at your uh, your calendar, which tells you your sprint duration. You list all your team members and their roles. You look at your team members allocation. Who has a hundred percent um allocation to work during that sprint? Who has a um fifty percent? I'm just using that fifty percent as um. An example, it could be 40%, it could be 60%, depending on the agreement you have with the other scrum master or where you're borrowing that resources from, okay? And then you're looking at the standard working hours per day and also per sprint. You're looking at, you'll be able to, your step five is to be able to put in all those factors that you need to consider. Your varying factor, you know, all the day is not fixed. They are varying factors. Um, team holiday, individual day or partial day or, um, um, trainings planned and all that. Those are varying factors that comes into place. And then you're also considering your fixed factors. The scrum events are fixed factors. Some meetings might be fixed factor. The team, in that your team chatter, the team might have been agreed to say that, oh, every sprint, we would make sure that we have a sprint. Um, for every sprint, we'll make sure that we have a sprint, uh, what is it called, um, a meeting. You put that into place. And also you have your... 